Hey everyone, and welcome back to the deep dive. Today we're diving into something that might sound a little technical at first, but trust me, it gets really interesting. We're going to be talking about predicting things based on data, specifically looking at mortgage defaults. And the surprising idea that sometimes less is actually more when it comes to making accurate predictions. Yeah, that's right. Less data, more accuracy. It kind of goes against everything we think we know about big data, right? It, it really does. You would think more information would always give you an edge. But this research paper, Time Series Feature Redundancy Paradox, an empirical study based on mortgage default prediction, really challenges that assumption. Thank you for tuning in to Quantopian's Quant Radio, your AI-driven podcast exploring everything related to quantitative finance. If you enjoy this episode, don't forget to like and subscribe to stay updated on future releases. For more quant-focused content, join us at community.quantopian.com. There you can explore a wealth of resources, connect with fellow quants, engage in insightful discussions, and enhance your skills through our extensive range of online courses. Quant Radio is intended to help people develop their knowledge and skills in quant finance. This podcast is not intended to provide investment advice. And now, back to the episode. Okay, so break that down for us. What exactly did these researchers do and what makes their findings so groundbreaking? Well, they took this massive data set of mortgage data. It spans an entire decade from 2012 to 2022. They basically wanted to see how different factors influence mortgage default predictions. So they tested a whole bunch of different prediction models, some simple, some super complex, just to see what worked best. So they're trying to predict who's likely to default on their mortgage. Mm -hmm. And they're using all this data to do it. But where does this whole less is more idea come in? Well, that's where it gets really interesting. They found that the models that were trained on shorter, more recent periods, like just using data from the past year, actually performed better than the models that use the entire 10-year data set. Hold on. So you're saying using just a tiny slice of the data actually gave them better results. Okay. I'm definitely hooked. Tell me more. So it seems like the reason is that the older data can actually muddy the waters. I mean, think about it. The economy back in 2012 was totally different from what it is today. Right, yeah. And factors that might have been really strong predictors of default back then might be completely irrelevant now. Mm -hmm. So that older data, it introduces what the researchers called noise. It basically distracts the model from picking up on the most important signals. So it's not just about how much data you have. It's about the quality of the data. Like, how relevant is it to the current situation? It's like trying to predict tomorrow's weather based on what happened 10 years ago. Not really helpful. Exactly. And it wasn't just about the time frames either. They also messed around with the number of variables, you know, the features they fed into these models. Oh. So they started with 26 features, narrowed it down to 18 by getting rid of some redundant ones, and then they zeroed in on a core set of just 10 features, the ones that seemed most directly related to defaults. So they're basically saying, let's cut through all the clutter and just focus on what really matters. Yeah. Did this kind of minimalist approach actually pay off? Oh, big time. The models that use that smaller, more focused set of features consistently outperform the ones using all 26. And this was regardless of the time frame they were looking at. Turns out having too many variables can actually make it harder for the model to identify the truly important factors. That makes sense, yeah. It's like trying to listen to a symphony while 100 people are talking over it. You just can't pick out the melody. That's a great way to put it. By simplifying things, by picking the right data, picking the right features, they got a much clearer picture. This all sounds pretty revolutionary. Yeah. Are there any specific results that really highlight this whole less is more idea? Yeah, absolutely. One of the most impressive results came from a model called a transformer. This model is really good at dealing with these long sequences of data like time series. So when they use the transformer with that set of 10 key features on just one year of data, it hit an accuracy score measured by something called ROC AUC of 0.895, which is really high. And what's even more impressive is that even when they expanded the time window to the full 10 years, the transformer still did a pretty good job. It showed that it can handle these longer periods without getting bogged down by all that noise. Okay, so this transformer model sounds like a total game changer, especially when you combine it with this streamlined approach to the data. But I got to ask, I mean, what does all this mean for the people who are actually out there trying to predict mortgage defaults in the real world? 
What are the like the practical takeaways here? So this research offers some really valuable insights for anyone who's working with predictive models, especially in fields like finance where things are constantly changing. First of all, it suggests that updating your models regularly with the most recent data is super important. You know, it's better to have a model that's really laser focused on current market conditions than one that's trying to incorporate every little blip and dip from the past. So it's like spring cleaning for your data, out with the old, in with the new. Exactly. And secondly, it really highlights how important it is to be careful about which features, which pieces of information you feed into the models. You know, don't just throw everything in there and hope for the best. Take the time to identify the factors that are most likely to be relevant right now. This is all really fascinating stuff. I'm curious, had you been thinking about how this whole less is more thing might apply to other areas where we try to predict the future? I bet our listeners have been connecting the dots. But would other fields come to mind where clinging to tons of historical data might actually be holding us back? This research really got me thinking about areas where things change really rapidly. Like imagine trying to predict next year's fashion trends based on what people were wearing a decade ago. Or think about trying to predict which tech gadgets will be the hot sellers next Christmas based on data from five years ago. Yeah. Those predictions would probably be hilariously outdated. Exactly. In fields like fashion, technology, even social media trends, the landscape shifts so quickly that relying too heavily on past data could lead you down the wrong path. So it's not just about trimming down the amount of data, but being super strategic about which data we keep. It's like you wouldn't use a map from the 1800s to navigate a modern city, right? Some landmarks might still be there, but you'd probably end up lost pretty quickly. That's a perfect analogy. And it really reinforces the idea that context is key. You know, blindly applying a model that was trained on historical data without considering the current market dynamics or emerging technologies, that's a recipe for disaster. It's like trying to bake a cake using a recipe from 100 years ago. The ingredients and techniques have probably changed quite a bit. So we need to be adaptable, not just in how we choose our data, but in our whole approach to making predictions. What are some other practical steps we can take to make sure we're using data effectively in these rapidly changing fields? Well, one crucial aspect is feature selection, which we talked about earlier. You know, if we're trying to predict something like consumer behavior in a fast paced market, we need to make sure we're focusing on the variables that are most relevant right now, not just the ones that were important in the past. It's like a detective trying to solve a case. You want to focus on the freshest clues, not get bogged down by irrelevant details from years ago. So it's not enough to just be picky eaters about the timeliness of our data. Mm. We also need to be selective about the specific ingredients we use in our predictive recipe. This sounds like it requires a lot of expertise knowing what to look for and what to ignore. Absolutely. You need people who really understand the nuances of the field that they're working in, you know, who can spot the emerging trends and who can guide the model building process to make sure it's capturing the most relevant information. It's like having a seasoned chef in the kitchen who knows exactly which spices will bring out the flavors of a dish. So we're not just looking for data scientists anymore. We need data chefs. But what about keeping up with all the new developments, technology, algorithms, even the way we collect data, it's all changing so fast. How do we stay ahead of the curve? That's where continuous learning comes in. The world of data is constantly evolving, so we need to be lifelong learners. It's like being a student in a never-ending masterclass, always eager to absorb new techniques, try out new tools, and push the boundaries of what's possible with data. It's like we're all in this exciting data-driven adventure, and we need to make sure we pack the right gear, learn from experienced guides, and adapt to the changing terrain along the way. It's been quite a journey. Absolutely. Thanks for joining us on this deep dive, and until next time, keep exploring, keep questioning, and keep diving deep into the world of knowledge.